Greetings and welcome to an LGR camera thing. And this delightful example is the Canon RC250 Zapshot, released at 800 US dollars in December of 1988, as well as being launched as the RC251 Ion in Europe and the RC250 QPIC in Japan. And this is what was known as a still video camera. Which means that the RC250 takes photos by capturing a video feed and storing them as a still freeze frame image for displaying like a photograph. And to do this, it uses these 2 inch video floppy or VF discs. Originally called Mavipacks when developed by Sony, these were built to be used with early Sony Mavica cameras. Several manufacturers later took advantage of the format, including Canon here, through the mid 80s and into the early 90s as a sort of stopgap between analog film cameras and fully digital cameras. So yeah, this is not a digital camera, even though it packs a CCD and uses floppy disks which would normally store data in a digital fashion. Instead, it records single frames of NTSC or PAL video onto each of the disc's 50 tracks with the ability to record 50 images on cameras like the RC250 that support high VF or high band video floppy disks. And each track on disc allows for writing, erasing, and rewriting through the camera itself on the fly. Quite fantastic in the years of film. That's what I mean about this being a kind of stopgap between film and digital. It's just a fascinating thing, technically speaking, and the fact that it uses such a tiny floppy disk pleases my very soul. As for the RC250 itself, it was quite a popular model back in the day, at least as far as still video cameras were concerned. The press were certainly impressed, with the RC250 being one of the first filmless electronic cameras to hit the market at a reasonable price. By comparison, Canon's RC701 video floppy disk camera from 1986 started at $2600, limiting its appeal quite a bit. So just in time for the 100th anniversary of the original Kodak box camera, Canon released the RC250 at under $1,000, leading popular mechanics to say in a century or so, it might share the Kodak's status as the first of its kind to make an esoteric technology available to millions. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I also love how some magazines described the shape of the zap shot, such as PC Magazine describing it as about the size of a well-packed sandwich. Depending on the sandwich, I'd say that's spot on. Before we get to trying out the zap shot, let's take a gander at what you got in the box back in 88. Despite it being a bit beat up, the contents were still complete and in lovely condition inside, so I was quite happy to have won this on eBay a while ago. Inside the box, you get two smaller boxes, the first one containing the camera itself tucked into a fitted styrofoam tray alongside a drawstring carrying bag, all of which I've seen have begun to deteriorate. Inside the second box, you get the usual assortment of end-user paperwork, as well as a neatly put-together manual that succinctly describes and illustrates the various functions and accessories for the RC250. Gotta love those sharp illustrations, mmm. Then you get another tray filled with accessories, like the wall power slash charging unit and a tightly packaged rechargeable battery that has undoubtedly lost its mojo. Lastly are the various cables and adapters for charging and plugging the camera into a playback device. More on that soon. As for the sandwich-sized camera itself, I think it's quite a pleasing design with its soft rounded corners and chunky disk drive eject mechanism. Ah, that feels sublime. Along the front of the camera, you get a flash, the eject button, a window for the viewfinder to find views, an LED indicator for timing pictures, and this nifty amalgam of circular doodads. On the left is the exposure metering window, on bottom is a white balance sensor, and on top is the lens itself. The lens is of the 11mm fixed focus variety with an f-stop of 2.8, and yep, this means you have a pretty low field of view being the equivalent of a 60mm lens on a 35mm camera. While its shooting range is 1 meter to infinity, it also boasts a macro mode switch on top here that allows for shooting as close as 30 centimeters or about 1 foot. On top, you get a two-step shutter button, a slider switch for flash options, another slider for powering it on and changing modes, some reverse and forward feed buttons for switching disc tracks, a shooting mode selector, a plus 1.5 step exposure compensator, and an LCD panel for displaying LCDs on a panel. And around back you get a wrist wrap, the viewfinder surrounded by a dioptric focus ring for crappy eyes like mine, 
and a connection for video output. Yep, in order to view the photos, you have to hook this thing up to a display through composite or RF, either directly through this cable or by routing it through the power adapter. And finally, there's a spot for a 200 milliamp hour lead storage battery, of which I've never run across one that still holds a charge. Thankfully, it came with that wall adapter, so I'm not completely out of luck, though I had to haul this portable battery pack around while taking photos, so that's fun. A further annoyance is the lack of a lens cap, and as far as I know, this never came with one. Sucks since I kept accidentally touching the lens whenever I pulled it out to use it, so it could really use one, but oh well. Taking a pic is straightforward stuff. Just switch into the record mode, letting it count down to the first available track on the disc. After that, press the shutter button and it'll take a picture. I just love every sound this thing makes, from the disc loading to the shutter. Sounds even cooler in the surprisingly quick continuous shooting mode, too. It'll then move on to the next available track on the disc, displaying the current one you're about to record to on the LCD. And if you want to erase a photo, just move the main switch to erase, use the reverse and forward buttons to choose the track you don't want, hold down the mode button and press the shutter. Oh yeah. You're now ready to view your photos on a TV. Er, well, if it still worked anyway. So the zap shot and video floppy disk cameras in general have become a bit of an obsession for me over the past year, largely because finding functional hardware is a challenge. The first one I got was this Sony MVC-C1, also from 1988. It uses the same 50-track VF discs and is a truly sexy piece of hardware in my view, so I was psyched to review it, but of course, it wasn't working. It wouldn't even read a disc, and all attempts at repair were in vain. Then I got a good deal on this complete inbox RC250 zap shot, which the seller said was unused, and hopefully that meant it was in fully working order. But of course not, that would be too easy. Turns out everything functioned except the ability to actually view your photos, which is the entire point. So I grabbed another supposedly working RC250 with yet another bundle of accessories and a claim from the seller that it was fully functional. But once again, it had plenty of issues, even more than the last one. Not only would it refuse to take photos, but playing back exposed discs wasn't happening, just got nothing but static. Finally, I decided to skip the whole idea of playing discs through the camera itself and sought out one of these professional video floppy disk recorders. Say hello to the Sony MVR5300 High VF Still Video Recorder, which sold for over 4,000 US dollars in 1994. While Canon, Sony, and others did indeed sell video floppy players for the home, units like this one were never marketed at retail, instead being sold largely through medical, scientific, and industrial suppliers for use with professional imaging devices. But since it uses these same video discs and I got a decent deal, I figured why not give it a shot. Anyway, after spending an irksome quantity of time and money, I finally had success. And just like the camera itself, operating the MVR5300 is a pleasure with its slot-loading disk drive and glowing orange LEDs. This machine can do a lot, but for now I'm just going to use it for scrolling through these photos I took with the Canon. You can go through each of them individually at your own pace, or you can use this interval wheel and the autoplay mode to go through them like a slideshow. And that really was how these still video cameras were sold to consumers for a time. Basically, a fancy slide projector without the slides or the projector. On top of this, several video printers were released throughout the 90s to create hard copies, albeit not very cheaply, and there were even early computer capture devices that allowed for digitizing analog video, an even more costly proposition. But in the late 80s, the main idea behind still video cameras was just plugging it into a TV and viewing them that way. And as you can see, it really is like looking at paused frames of video, complete with wobbly imagery and strange artifacting. Though I have a feeling much of that is due to the hardware having degraded now that multiple decades have passed. In a way, it's kind of awesome though. I mean, check out this old disc that one of my cameras came with. Not only is it filled with some authentic retro pics taken by a previous owner, but its particular style of analog distortion and noise is a vaporwave wet dream, not to mention a prime candidate for some cursed image material. And the more I recorded, erased, and re-recorded to this disc, the more the resulting imagery became increasingly corrupt, much like what you'd get by doing the same with a VHS tape. 
I still had similar results with new old stock video discs, so unfortunately this means that I can't show photos as cleanly as I'd prefer. Hopefully this is still decent enough to get across the idea of what photos taken with the RC250 look like. As usual with older cameras, I like taking photos of older things, and the Zapshot produces some fantastically retro imagery. Again, it's like a hybrid of what I'd expect from both vintage film and vintage digital, a pleasing mix of analog and electronic. And with its high band specification, it was supposed to be able to capture 500 vertical lines of video resolution, but in practice it ended up being fewer than 400 from what I've read. Still, the images are clearer than I imagined they'd be, and the color reproduction is vibrant without being overblown. And for the most part, it handles all sorts of lighting situations quite happily, with it tending to skew more towards underexposing rather than going over, even with compensation enabled. It also does an admirable job in terms of color reproduction, UV filtering, and dynamic range. Just compare this shot of the same scene taken on my phone's camera. Obviously the resolution and analog capture device aren't doing this any favors, but still. <laughs> and as an example of how zoomed in every shot is with the RC250, here's the uncropped smartphone shot. Yeah, due to that 11mm lens, you have to stand a good 10 or so feet farther away from subjects than you might think. But as someone who often shoots with a 50mm prime lens, I don't mind at all, and in fact I love the results I get with this RC250. And I do mean this one in particular, because again, it's kinda screwed up, and I've never once gotten a completely uncorrupt photo from it, and that's okay! When it comes to retro photography, I don't often reach for a camera that's going to provide crispy high-res reproductions of reality. If I want to do that, I use a DSLR or my phone, but if I'm going to go retro, I often go for something that uses obsolete media or something a little bit fallible that produces unpredictable results. And the Canon RC250 Zapshot with its 2-inch high VF discs fits that job perfectly for me. And if you enjoyed this episode of LGR, perhaps you'd care to take a look at some of the other retro camera videos I've made, or any of the other old and odd technical thingies that I cover here every week. As always though, thank you very much for watching.